Lots of photography news and a new product to review. Hey everyone, welcome to Keep Shooting Monday, number 103. My name is Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. Last week, Adobe Max was the big event that was going on. They had a bunch of product updates and additions. You can watch the video that I put up here with their major things for photographers. Definitely worth the watch. Gives you the kind of the, the once over of all the new stuff for photographies, sorry, for photographers this year. So um, one of the things that they changed was uh, some slight updates for Lightroom. It was either 6.2 or 2015.2. Um, one of the issues or one of the things that they changed was the import feature. They dumbed it down, tried to make it simpler. While it's fine for a power user, the old one was fine for a power user, the new people that are just jumping into to Lightroom, it can seem a little bit daunting. So that I'm sure that's why that they got rid of some of the features and started to kind of kind of make it a little bit easier for everyone to use. Um, they actually put out an apology for that update because there were some bugs in there, and they may or may not bring back the auto eject card feature that you can use on the Max. The Max that's a, that's I guess that's important to some people. Um, personally, I have never once used that auto eject feature. Uh, I know also another thing that they got rid of is the move feature. So if you would insert your card, it would automatically move the photos from the card onto your hard drive. I am not a fan of either of those features. Uh, personally, I prefer to either use the Finder or Windows Explorer in order to move those photos first um, because I want my file structure to be in a certain way, my folders to be in a certain way, and then renamed. So you can call me anal, but um, I'm just not a fan. Another article that I found is that uh, you can actually, people will actually take the mul multiple cards. They'll have multiple cards all at the same time, and they'll be copying and importing from multiple cards. I'm just not a fan of that. I just feel like it would be, it would create more issues and it'd give a better chance of a corrupting an image or lots of images if you're doing that um, because you're probably pushing to a, hard, a single hard drive, which is going to slow down all the cars. It's definitely not going to be faster, but people liked it because they could just set it and forget it and then come back in 30 minutes and they'd be all updated and done. Um, personally, just not a fan. Not a fan at all. I, I definitely would not change that, and that's not something that I would be missing at all. So um, if you feel you want it back, maybe a comment over on the Adobe forums. Uh, otherwise, just let it go and keep using it as they intended, or as I intend, if you want to put it that way. Uh, there's a new camera from a company called Light. It's called an L16. It has 16 separate camera modules. Uh, with an interesting form factor, probably about the size of a larger iPhone, the 6 Plus iPhone, but thicker. And um, up, they say that up to 10 of these cameras fire simultaneously, up to a 52 megapixel photo. And so it's hard to say what the quality of this thing is, but um, it could be interesting. Basically, more pixels mean better low light. Quality, oh, I'm sorry, larger pixels mean lower, lower light, light quality, better low light quality. So that's a it's a good thing to, to be able to put that out there. So we'll see what the long term is. One of the cool other features that they have, which could allow for some additional creativity, is the fact that you could change your aperture later in the photos. So that, uh, that could be interesting for us as photographers to be more creative. Now, the new product that's out there is the Microsoft Surface Book. The Surface Book uh, could be a pretty powerful machine. Uh, it actually has a separate discrete graphics card built into the bottom machine where the keyboard is and has a battery in there, as well as having a battery and onboard graphics in the primary board in the back of the screen. 
So you can detach those. It actually has electromagnetic magnets, and you can turn those on and off, and it'll detach. You can spin it around and then attach them both together and kind of fold it back over onto itself. Use it like a tablet and hold it in your arm. Um, just the machine by, or the, the, just the tablet portion of it, the screen portion of it, I think they, I was watching Tested, and I think they said that that was like a three to four hour machine as far as battery life because it does have a super high resolution screen and it is doing a lot of work. It's a full i5 or an i7 processor with uh, an SSD in it. So it's a pretty hefty machine to start out with. So it could certainly be a really excellent laptop. If you're looking, if you're in the market, maybe hold out a little bit longer, see what, what comes out, see what the reviews are like. Um, I'm sure you can go to a store near you and you'll be able to test it out. Sit it side by side next to the Dells, the Toshibas, the Asus, all the other brands that are out there. I'm not a big HP fan as far as their laptops are concerned, but um, you could certainly compare them against them too. So, and of course, the MacBooks. You know, they're they're I would say they're a, a direct competitor for a MacBook um, because personally, I love the Apple hardware. As far as the software is concerned, I could take it or leave it. I could I'd be just as happy running Windows on a MacBook as I am running Mac OS X on a MacBook. I, either one, they just seem to be pretty equivalent to me. I don't really see a difference. There's no difference in processing power, speed. Um, I, just there are some, some things that I have to have if, for my website design business in order to be able to have Safari and test websites on that. So that's why I run Mac OS, and that's why I originally bought it. But as far as the laptop itself and the hardware, I love the hardware. I think it's a really good machine. So NASA released all of their, or a lot of their, thousands of different scans of old negatives. And I'm, I don't know if they were just negatives or, or if they were also transparencies, but tons and tons of those. You can go, go and look at them on their Flickr account, their just some amazing images on there, and I'm just kind of enchanted with all of those. I just think it's amazing seeing all those different images and, you know, just the, the photography and the light and the everything and uh, the angles and, the you know, the fact that you're looking down at Earth just is, just enchants me. It's just like, oh, oh, you know, it's just really, really neat. So uh, go over and check those out. Also, there was a video. Where'd it go? I had it here. Oh, man. Uh, I also, there was a video. Oh, there it is right here. There was a video released by Tom Cousy, who took all those images and added 3D motion in Adobe After Effects and basically just made a video out of them or like a little two and a half minute movie out of a few of those images and added some additional motion to them. Wow, you add some music, you add some motion to those photos, and it seriously is like a really awesome sci-fi movie. So definitely check that out. Spend that two and a half minutes. Don't do this. Don't do this. Stay off the train tracks. A woman was arrested for a photo shoot on the train tracks. Why the photographer wasn't arrested too, I'm not sure. And there's some noises in the background. Let's kill that noise. Anyway... Um, they were caught on a surveillance camera taking photos on the train tracks, which is not good because you can die if you touch the third rail, which is 750 volts. And so, plus, you can get hit by a train. So, stay off of the train tracks. If you are going to do it and be adventurous, maybe do it where there's no cameras around watching you. That might be the better way to go. So, yeah, don't do that. Canon put out some new printers this week. They're actually, their new Pro printer line, P-R-O printer line. They have 60-inch, 44-inch, 24-inch, and 17-inch printers all coming out at once. They have 12-ink uh, systems and um, also have five monochrome inks in there. So that's really nice. You have some really great black and whites coming out of those machines. Um interesting i love seeing competition i love when one company does one thing and another one get, uh, does another keeps improving and improving because that ju only makes the products better for us as end users and purchasers of the devices 
So that's really cool. Uh, Epson also released their P400 13-inch photo printer. Uh, last year, they released the P600, and they have new machines up to 44 inches. I believe it's up to 44, but they may have a 60 also. I'm not positive on that. Anyway, um, their ink is going to be a little bit cheaper. Supposedly, in this article on Photography Bay, they say it's a direct replacement for the R2000, but I don't know that for sure. I'm going to try and confirm that to see whether it is a direct replacement. The R2000 is an amazing printer. It does a ton of stuff. The colors are great. Um, but you get a little bit cheaper cartridges with this new uh, P400. And the colors and the blacks are amazing coming out of this thing. When they showed it to me last year and sent me some samples, that kind of thing. What an amazing, amazing quality coming out of it. Just a, a simple photo printer. When you combine that with that and their papers, it is awesome. So earlier I teased a little bit about a new product that I had to review. Well, Epson sent over one of their Epson Perfection V850 desktop scanners. This thing will scan any kind of a uh, photo, uh, negatives, transparencies, large format, medium format, 35 millimeter, I cannot wait to start playing with this thing. I'm also going to have an entire series of videos in the Photo Academy series just on scanning. So I know a lot of photographers are going back to film and they shoot a lot of film and then they go and they scan it. So instead of sending that out, you could then just scan the things that you really needed, the images that you really wanted and uh, you wouldn't need to worry about you know paying for that entire roll to just choose the two or three that you actually needed or wanted so uh, definitely check this machine out i can't wait to actually get my hands on it waiting on a couple of replies to some emails to i haven't even installed it yet i took it out of the box and it's sitting over there but that's all the farther i've gotten so it's it's i'm like itching to play with it i actually dug out all my old negatives yesterday so i was playing with those and looking at those and looking you know old school some of the 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 horrible photos that i did back in the day when i was first learning some of them weren't too bad but some of them were just terrible it's it is funny it's a learning experience to go back and see some of those old photos that you've taken for when you first started um it's good and bad, so it's kind of embarrassing sometimes, but that's the way it goes. So uh, let's, uh, let's answer a couple of gazillion questions. Pedamonte writes, I always shoot an AFS with lowest f-stop because I've been told to keep it as low as possible. I always go zoomed in max 55mm because of the kit lens with Raynox 250 DCR macro converter. It gives me a 5.3 and I want more in focus. So you shoot an AFC. Do you have a video that explains that setting? Would love to see and use it. First, a comment about that. Do yourself a favor and learn the camera. Learn your ISO shutter aperture so that you know how they work, what they're actually doing. Don't just go by what someone else has told you what to do and how to use it. Just do yourself that favor and, and learn it, do it, own it yourself. Don't just do what someone else tells you you need to do. You'll end up a much better photographer if you do that. Uh, my Photo Academy series is just is exactly for that. Uh, this week, I promise I'm going to be putting up my focus video, so make sure you check that out. And I will be going over AFC and the other focus modes and when to use each one of those. I'm somewhat new to Lightroom CC 2015. I'm somewhat new to Lightroom CC 2015. I just had an idea for you to do a video on Lightroom and as create and saving different crop size templates. I can't find a way to do it in the crop overlay. So this is easier than you might think. When you're in the crop tool inside of Lightroom, all you need to do is hit this little drop down right here and click enter custom and then type in your numbers and then that will be selected and you can use it in the future. Unfortunately, and I don't know why this is, Adobe has never, and I think I've been requesting this since either Adobe uh, Lightroom 3 or 4, because that's how long I've been doing the uh, wishlist videos for Adobe Lightroom. 
they don't allow you to do a crop preset inside of uh, the develop module. You can click on this, add new preset, but there's no option in here in order to save a crop. Why that is, I don't know. I never will understand why they wouldn't allow that. Um, I can think of lots of times when I would love to use it, especially when I'm shooting tethered, I'm shooting the same product in a different aspect ratio, say four to five, or I'm showing photos to a client, maybe they pop up on a screen, why wouldn't you allow that crop to be set and then I could add it at, at import, that kind of thing. It would be really nice to have that option, but they don't allow it, so you're stuck with doing them manually and maybe add it to one photo and it'll automatically apply over to the rest. As you were saying here in the print module, you can create a template. Um, what you do is you choose your paper size. Uh, I have 24 by 11.5 chosen on my Epson Stylus Pro 7800 and then set that cell size at 11 by 14 and it'll print out to the correct size when it comes out and you can just cut it down and it'll be done. Uh, obviously you don't need to make your paper much bigger than what it really needs to be. Get a good quality cutter or just take it to your photo framer and allow them to cut it once it's matted. Sometimes it's a little bit easier for them to do the cutting rather than you cut it first, especially if it's something big that's gonna be mounted. Uh, they can just uh, mount it oversized and then trim it and put it into the frame so it could be a little bit easier for them to go that route. Just talk to your framer, figure out how you're going to do it. Do yourself a favor, stay away from the big box stores as far as framing is concerned, custom framing. If you're getting individual frames and doing it yourself, it's not an issue. But if any kind of custom framing, find a real good cust local custom framer that can do the work for you. They're going to be a, a much better quality, have a lot more options, and be a lot more artistic rather than just the, you know, 19, 20 year old that's behind the counter at, that got stuck behind the counter that day at Michael's because someone else called out. Or they're going to be just selling you the frame that they got cheap that month that they have, you know, 30 pallets of that they need to get rid of that molding. So um, definitely the right way to go. Try and find someone local. It will also usually give you a little discount since you're a photographer, especially if you're selling the work. They'll give you that discount, and then you can use that as your markup. So, you know, it, it usually works out great in a, in a couple different ways. So uh, I think that is it for today's show. We'll see you next week. Make sure you come back. Make sure you check out that Adobe Max video I did last week. And this week I'm going to be putting up that focused video in the Photo Academy series. Thanks, guys. Keep shooting.